What's your favorite scary movie? We all go a little mad sometimes. Get away from her, you bitch! Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend to the end. This is my boomstick! Swallow this. All right, guys, back once again with the Air on the Head show. I got my co-host, the always amazing Mr. John Fallon. John, how are you doing? What's going on? I'm great, man. I'm, I'm fantastic, actually. It was nice to see you in Vegas uh, at the party with you and meet you uh, in person for the first time. Yeah, um, yeah. After all this time, we actually get to face, uh, meet face to face. Yeah, definitely. I must say you did not disappoint. The man can handle his liquor. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Yes. Uh, what are you doing in, by the way? Hmm. What, what's on the menu yes. today? All right, so I have the the rest of my um, banana blueberry made, and I should also say, I, I actually made my other one uh, last night, so I got yeah. another one fucking cooking, and just to be a little classy, because I thought I'd, I'd wear a little suit jacket, I got uh, Cardu or Chardu, I don't know how to say it correctly, it's a, it's a single malt scotch, it's really, really good. Um, nice, I mean, nice. I'll send it to you for your uh, your little celebration after yeah, this is done. Definitely, so. thank you so much, man, I appreciate it. What about you, buddy? Um, I'm actually, uh, I'm going no hard liquor for a month. So I'm uh, I'm gonna go Guinness in a can again. It's not like Guinness on tap, No, but it's better than nothing. All right, well then, hey, today is, uh, we decided, we didn't talk about this last time, uh, mm -hmm. today is Stephen King. Yes. Yeah, so you and me Stephen gonna- King. I mean, so many movies uh, and TV series and TV movies uh, adapted from his work. Of course, we're not gonna cover all of his movies. That'd be like, that'd take like five episodes, maybe down the road. I don't know, I, I personally, I picked some of my favorites. You did the same, I assume, right? I picked a, a purposely uh, eclectic list. Because I'll be honest, if we were going to my favorites, we'd just be talking Shawshank and a few others. But I wanted to go for a little weirder ones that I don't think people give a chance. So I'm open to dig into the ones that I think people ignore, which they shouldn't. Um, and again, I, we should talk about this. You and me don't really discuss what we're doing outside of this. I think the element of surprise kind of works for us. Obviously, well, yeah, I, would have, surprise, I, yeah. I would have watched Shocker if I would have known. But, but that's good. It's it's an honest reaction. So I'll let you jump off because I don't know sure. what you have. I just know that we don't have the same one. So, John, what are we going to surprise him with? Shocker. Fucking Christ. <laughs> yeah, I still haven't seen it. Yeah, I still haven't seen it. You know, I, hate, I always hated the expression guilty pleasure. Because if I derive pleasure out of anything, why would I feel guilty? So a lot of people call this movie a guilty pleasure. I don't feel no guilt whatsoever. And that's Stephen King's uh, sole director credit, Maximum Overdrive. The you know the movie, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. His, his cocaine binge. With the <laughs> that's it. That's his co uh, cocaine binge movie. Uh, by his own admission, Mr. King was high on coke the entire shoot, and it shows in a good way. Uh, for me, Maximum Overdrive, <laughs> I've always said, dude, it's a movie about machines that kill people, like trucks or soda machines or lawnmowers. It's not remains of the day. So for what it is, I think it's fucking fantastic. Narrative structure that Mr. King has used a lot, a bunch of people trapped in one environment with like evil shit around. So he did it in, in The Mist mm -hmm. and he does it again in Maximum Overdrive. Uh, Maximum Overdrive, if you guys haven't seen it, a comet goes around the earth and all the machines come to life and start whacking peeps. And I think it's aliens, but who gives a shit? Uh, so many great scenes in that movie. The opening, the bridge, the cars, the pileup, the destruction, uh, the King cameo where the uh, bank machine tells him he's an asshole. This machine just called me an asshole. The soda machine attack on the baseball team. Uh, the Kids pop. getting whacked, run uh, over a fucking bulldozer. I mean, you don't see that shit in it. Kid on a bike, being chased on a lawnmower. It's just fucking bedlam, this fucking movie. It's, it's, you know what? It's funny because it has a um, score, a soundtrack by ACDC. And the that's what the movie feels like to me. It's a heavy metal song put to screen with a fuckload of carnage. Um, yeah, the middle section, in my opinion, kind of lags. It's a little boring, but the ACDC kept me going. You know, you don't watch these kind of movies for character studies. So, you know, Pat Engel uh, got on my fucking nerves. Um, her name, the, the girl that does, uh, Edley Smith. Uh, Lisa. That does the voice of Lisa yeah. Simpson. Oh my God. She's with that pussy whipped husband 
and she keeps busting his balls the whole movie. I wanted to take her and throw out a fucking window. Um, the uh, horny Bible salesman guy. I don't know if you remember that shit. Who's the uh, Who's the actor? Oh, come on, dude. No, his name's Mister Nobody. Oh, okay. All right. The character himself was very annoying. Well, character-wise, not a really strong film, but the situation, the kills, the carnage, the music, the Green Goblin truck. Yes. A very iconic, you know, look. Actually, there's one scene uh, where this uh, waitress, and I don't know the actress's name, she kind of goes fucking crazy, and she goes, and it's a, it echoes a bit the song by ACDC, Who, Who Made Who? She goes, we made you, we made you. She runs out of the diner, what the fuck, we made you. And then, 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 then. We made you, we made you. The military uh, truck kind of guns her down, I think. It's a fun, stupid, rock and roll, carnage heavy uh, horror film with a great soundtrack, good kills. And actually, yeah, I'm sure some of you know our fellow horror fans out there know the initial cut was so gory that they toned it down big time. And of course, as per so many movies, the footage has been lost. You know, we'll never see the uncut version. Uh, massacre scene in the, 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 base, well, the baseball with the kids. With the soda machine popping yeah. and then the fucking the, the steamroller runs the kid over. Yeah, yeah. steamrollers. He gets fucking like the uncut version. I saw pictures of it. Fucking splatter of fucking heaven. So I love that movie. I've always loved that movie. It's a movie that stayed with me. So many iconic scenes. So I highly recommend it if you've never seen it. That's it. What do you well, think of the movie? Well, let me ask you this though, because I know recently um Emilio Estevez and I, or King, I think it was Mestevez that came out and said like his biggest regret was Maximo of Drive. And even King has come out and, and said like he regrets doing it. And what I guess I'm kind of curious about is that even if this <clears throat> was intended to be scary, which I don't think it was, or if it was, somehow it became the complete opposite. It, it's such a pulp fun movie. I don't get why King or SMS can't sit back and be like, oh, it's it's stupid fun. It, it's, you know, because even I think King was quoted saying he wanted to make um he wanted to make an idiot movie. You know, he was saying something like that. He wanted to make a, an a, a idiot, dumb, trashy, fun movie. And I think he did. So I don't really get why King or SMS has any regrets. It's like, well, yeah, it's it's not a scary movie, but it's a fun movie. And, and as far as I'm concerned. And not only that, it's a cult classic. Yeah. It, still, we're talking about it right now. Fun movies. Yeah. But well, who's the fuck's talking about Men at Work during Emilio Estevez? <laughs> it's know? a fun movie. I, I hate it when people do that. I, I'm the same way. I, I don't... Here's the thing. Once you make something and let it out in the world, it's not yours. And I always bring this up like with um, David Gilmore. He's like The Wall. It's like, well, tough shit. The Wall's great. So, you know, pony up, sweetheart. Like, it's not yours anymore. It's, it's ours. I yeah. you know, And the Beatles didn't like Let It Be. I, I just... I, I feel like artists need to kind of step back and be like, okay, well, even if it's not the movie I wanted to make, once it's out there and it finds a crowd, then that's the movie it's meant to be. You know, really? I know that T Tommy Wiseau meant to make The Room a dramatic movie, but he, he, he fucked it up so bad. It's a comedy. But know what he did? He goes, oh, it's a comedy. And then I see him at every local theater playing football and signing autographs. He, he owns. So I just wish yeah. King and um, Estevez would own this movie. Really just kind of dumb fun. So yeah. it's like, I like this shit. I prefer this over sometimes some serious stuff because... As much as I like a good serious movie, I'll watch something like Maximum Overdrive a lot more. If That's I got it right now, got to watch Shawshank Redemption or Maximum Overdrive, I'm going with the trucks. Oh, Which, wow. by the way, the movie was based on King's short story, Trucks. And by the way, it was a TV movie based on the same story called Trucks, but I'm not going there. All that to say, I hate it. I personally hate it when artists look back and then, you know, yeah. write off shit that they did. No, man, everything you do leads you to the next thing, next thing, next thing. It's part of your path, your growth, your evolution, if you will, as an artist. Don't spit yeah. on what you did before because they led you to what you did next. And always Philosophy as an audience. By John Fallon, yeah. yeah. I agree, I agree. Even though I'll probably fight you in the Shawshank thing, but that's a different episode. So I'm depressing, fuck that movie. Can you be so obtuse? It's a, it, it is a, it's a, it's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece. It is a masterpiece, I love I, the movie. I, I watch I'll never that, watch it again. Oh my God, I watch it like every year. I'm like, I need a good soulful reminder. All right, well, different, different different yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, go, right. go, go. It's probably the most mainstream one I got. And it's one that I didn't revisit a lot, so I revisited it recently, which is uh, Christine, John Carpenter's oh. 1983 flick. It's been a Love while. Love that fucking movie, dude. Well, go. It's something I didn't grow up with, and I want to bring this up because a lot of the stuff that I have watched, I had the blessing of watching since I was a little kid, because there's no, there was no parenting uh, for the boomers. Let's be real clear on that for my generation. It was just, I rented what I wanted to and watched it. So I had good early education. I You're didn't... not a fucking boomer, man. 
No, my, pa- my parents were boomers. So. Oh, okay. So okay. I'm, I'm saying they didn't give a shit. They were like, I, I, I was like, yeah. oh, can I write Robocop? Like, yeah, go for it. I'm like, okay, hey, Robocop. I'm like four, you know? But the reason I bring up Christina is because I, I didn't watch it as a kid because I thought it was a car movie. And I'll be honest, I don't give a shit about cars. I'm the kind of guy you give a million dollars to, I'm going to buy a fucking Toyota and invest in like the market and buy a house so I have some property. I'm not, I'm not a car guy. Though, this car is gorgeous. It is gorgeous. Gorgeous. I love the 50s, man. I love that style. It, it's set in the 80s, but because it's King, uh, there's a lot of 50s influence because, you know, his childhood was the 50s. So a lot of things yeah. have that sort of like tie in. Um, and it's about this dorky kid who is a, you know, is a loser, gets made fun of him, has the little uh, tape between his glasses. He buys this old 50s car, is alive, and they kind of fall for each other. And the car basically protects him and murders people. It's a love story. Exactly. It, it, it's between a man a, and his possessed car sexual without physical sexuality yeah, yeah. he's not yeah, fucking a muffler yeah. no but but it, but it, it has that sort of growth of like him falling in love and he has yeah. this girl and he refers to his don't talk about my car the way you know it, it's this yeah. guy that never had a girl finally has one it's only a killer car gorgeous car by the way a couple of things i wrote down that I, I found kind of interesting after this recent rewatch very little blood it's not, in fact, a, a, a bloody movie at all. I mean, I don't want to say bloodless per se, but it's, it is not about the carnage. And I guess that's because Carpenter was coming off of a thing, which was a very gory sort of effects driven movie. And he yeah. specifically was like, I don't want this to be a gore fest. So I kind of want to tone it down and, and make it more of like a, a story driven, you know, movie about this kid's arc of going from a nerd to essentially the villain. And so I, I kind of find that the, the slow burn thing is interesting, especially for a movie like this that in a way should be schlocky, but it's taken dead serious. It, yeah. It's a slow build. Like I, I even timed it a little under the hour mark before the first kill. So we have almost the entire movie before anything actually happens. It's just a slow mm-hmm. build. I think that's kind of cool. You know, I mean, especially a, a killer car movie. It's really not about a killer car. It's just about this poor dork. Uh, Robert Prowski, uh, he's the old grandpa in Gremlins 2, plays the garage owner, who's so yeah. grumpy, it's amazing. I love a good grumpy character, John. It's like my favorite thing in the world. That's why I love like Lou Reed and Ben Morrison, because like they, they are the, these characters in real life, they just hate everything. And this guy's just sitting there. They're like and, you, basically. Yeah, I mean, but just good, <laughs> as it should be. I, I find that that archetype interesting, where you see uh, the, the main character comes in, he's like, he's trying to rent the space, and the guy's just such a dick, he's like, You're on probation, you get it? You screw around with me one time, I don't care how much money you paid up in front, I'll throw you out in your ass. Not to mention um, Home Alone's old man Marley. Now, I grew up in Home Alone because I'm that age, but he sells Keith Gordon the car, and even him. Yeah, Keith Gordon's awesome in the movie. Uh, yeah, it, he plays the nerd perfectly, but but old man Marley, which is uh, Robert's Blossom, it has this amazing line, I don't know if you remember it, but he was talking about for the first part of the car. He's like, yeah, I remember uh, that. She had the smell of a brand new car. That's just about the finest smell in the world. Except maybe for pussy. Would say, after this recent rewatch, one of Carpenter's most underrated scores. It's oh, a yeah, big time. Lo- low key, yeah. uh, a great little uh, driving force here. I think my only complaint, actually, and this is something I watch on digital, so I don't know if it's on the physical release, mm. but the score is mixed really badly shittily into the movie meaning that the, the score is too low it sits too low over the side. really I, I never got that from from watching it on my again end. i don't have a physical release but i'm digital yeah it's it's way too low under the sound effects and the 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 movie ambience you know that that scene the geek guy gets you know terrorized by a bunch of bullies and there's a scene where the car boom and i, I remember sound effects for some reason with the lights boom and the guy starts running away and then the car starts following him and then the score kicks in boom. That whole scene, I was like, oh, fuck. It's Stephen King and John Carpenter together, and it's fucking horror fucking genius. That that for me, that's what Christine, I'm, you know, you, you you spoke a lot about it, so I'm not gonna eternalize, but the style, the style of Christine. John Carpenter's eye, his, his ear for music, plus Stephen King's, you know, content, the car, the visuals. What I retain from Christine is the aesthetics, the audio visual. You know, filmmaking is a visual, audio-visual medium. It's not about, if you want to watch people talk for half an hour, an hour, two hours, you know, with static shots, then go see a play. But for me, when I go see a film, I want the film to stimulate me visually and audio-wise, to, to, to use its shots, to use the, 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 the lighting, uh, the score, to, to evoke emotions within me. And Christine does that. 
it, it looks like a Carpenter film, which I mean, yeah. as, it's one of my favorite directors. I can't wait till we do that episode because I'm fully. We're still going to do a John Carpenter episode. Fluent. But it has that look. I mean, really, I guess my only real complaint is that they don't use Harry Dean Stanton enough. I, I feel like he's wasted, but I mean, pro he's probably more of a favorite. I bet Carpenter's like, hey, hey, Stanton, you help me out in this movie real quick. And he like, does a cameo. But yeah. no, the look and the vibe, everything. And again, it's a slow burn. This is a killer car movie. I'd expect this to be Maximum Overdrive, and it's the opposite. A lot more of a character study than it has any right being. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. It's more character driven, more layered than, well, obviously than Maximum Overdrive. That's for sure. That's just about the finest smell in the world. Except maybe for pussy. And I actually picked it because there's a, a remake or a new adaptation in my ass, because I saw the trailer and it looks exactly like the original. Uh, Firestarter. Firestarter, starring, you know, Drew, Drew Barrymore, David Keith, George C. Scott, Martin Sheen. Of course, about uh, this young girl, played by Drew Barrymore, who has uh, psychic power. She's able to, like, light fires and shit. Who's being hunted down by, like, a government agency. Look, <clears throat> Fireballs. I could end right there, Fireballs. I'll always remember with that movie, The Last Act, where her name's Charlie, comes out with the Tangerine Dream score, Tangerine Dream did the score for Near Dark, by the way, as well. Genius, genius score on both films. Comes out, then the wind starts coming. Her hair starts waving. And then she's throwing fucking fireballs at mofos. And it's an iconic, stylized, and just beautiful to watch. And, you know, keep in mind, the original Firestarter was done before CGI, before VFX. So fireballs, they're fireballs. And it carry a lot of impact. The core of the film, for me anyways, is the heart of the film, if you will, is the relationship between the father and the daughter, which is played by David Keith. I had to look at my notes because fuse him with yeah. Keith David from They Live. They have the same name, but reverse. David Keith, great actor, and Drew Barrymore. So that's the heart of the film. Of course, you have George C. Scott as a um, Native American. I didn't really buy him as Native American, but nice eye patch. Uh, you know, chewing the scenery like a champ. You got Martin Sheen, you know, chewing the scenery like a champ. So it's directed by Mark L. Lester, who directed Commando. So the man knows a thing or two about action scenes. And uh, I find the, the action sequences in, in the picture are well done. It's not a great film, but it's a solid film. And, you know, I watched the trailer for the remake. Um, I'm just going to rewatch the original. I, I was like, I got nothing. It looks like a pale copy of the original. And not once in that trailer did I see a fireball that <laughs> impressed me as much as the fireballs in the OG. So Firestarter is definitely worth a watch. Not great, but pretty good, in my opinion. Have you seen it, by the way? Uh, it's been a long time, actually. Um, I, I So here's the thing. My initial memory of it was underwhelming. Mm -hmm. I do remember um, uh, George C. Scott because he had... A scar and he had the dead eye and he had the, the ponytail which just looks so weird you know so wait he didn't have an eye patch I, maybe later in the movie but i just remember he had like a this blue damaged eye he might mm. have at one point i mean it's been a while my thing with wire starter is that i always remember it being kind of boring and again i should revisit it i'll be honest this is going off of at least a couple of years ago at, at, at minimum probably more like five or ten but i just remember a lot of it had like flashbacks, which I thought was a little yeah. awkward. Oh, the, I thought they were well done, the flashbacks, actually. I just thought the pacing was weird. I, I don't want to truly shit on a movie that I haven't seen in a long time. This could be one of those that I just got bored when I saw it and I, I deserves a rewatch. Hmm. With the, the amount of King films out there, it's just sometimes tough to get back. Uh, going yeah. off going off of my basic memory, George C. Scott, remember I liking a lot. Uh, Heather Locklear is kind of weird. She's like the, the hot mom that dies. Spoilers. In fact, the one thing I remember is that like they're getting away, but they keep walking on like main streets and highways. And I'm like, go somewhere else. You know? That's where people <laughs> drive. It's like it's like me. It's like I'm gonna hide from the cops and Lakeshore Drive, or not, you know, or go in. So you know, it's being remade, and it, it already seems like the remake is being kind of slowly shuffled out. I have a feeling this is gonna be one of those like Texas Chainsaw 2022 things where they just gotta drop it. I could be wrong, but it, it, that trailer seemed a little cheap to me. The new one it was- did nothing for me. It did nothing for It looked it like, looked you cheap. know, they, 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 marketing wise, yeah. they're playing a new adaptation of the Stephen King. No, man. How accurate is the old one from the story though? Cause I don't know that either. I never know? read the books. So I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe I'll give it a watch if, if you think it's worth revisiting. I do like George C. Scott. I, I love um, Exorcist 3. 
So yeah, maybe it's it's worth sure. it to, to see that again. Um, this is just one of those ones that kind of like I saw a couple times and then I just kind of went back to. That being said, I have revisited things and giving things a second chance in my life that I ended up loving or, or that were slower when I was younger that I found more of a, a, a heartbeat later on. So this could be it's one a, of them. It's a seven on 10 for me, to be honest. Um, That's pretty good. That's seven actually on 10. Pretty, pretty, pretty damn good. Seven and seven. actually, w- w- one cool thing about, I don't know, because, you know, the thing is, you know, we're, we're getting older. I don't know if this this has happened to you or not, but movies I would watch in the 90s, which I found average at the time, I rewatched today and they're much better. Uh, why? It's before and like heavy VFX and it's a style of filmmaking um, that I personally connect to because I grew up on it. You know, movies from the, the 80s and 90s is what I grew up on. And today's style of filmmaking is much different and I don't connect to it as much. The Glimmer Man with Steven Seagal and Keenan Ivory Wayne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I saw on the big screen, which I thought was, eh, whatever. I rewatched it fairly recently. Masterpiece. (laughs) I had the time of my life. Well, so maybe you're able to have fun with it now. Maybe that's it, you know? No, no, but just, like I said, the style of filmmaking and, and, I don't know, the vibe. It's nostalgia, I guess. Nostalgia makes things that were average look better. I don't know, endearing. I love it. I don't glimmer, know how we the got glimmer here. Man is your example. It's like, yeah, because that's what we grew up in. That's what I love. And I, I'll always love that shit. And maybe maybe there's a flaw to it, but then in 30 years, the crap now left law. So I, I rather take my mid-level movies that like could get made of an interesting stories over this like weird boardroom making of movies now. Lethal Weapon would not exist today. So uh, as much as we, I, you know, I'm not saying there's not good movies today. There is. Arrival, Blade Runner 2049, uh, Hereditary. There's some good shit. But I, I'll take my stuff. Yeah. I got I got money down. You're going to watch Firestarter, the OG. And you're going to appreciate it way more. That brings me to my entry, which I'm going to go a little more obscure. Get my my notes here. Actually, let me get the old the old glasses going. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. go go for it, Grandpa. Sleepwalkers. Met oh. Garrison's Sleepwalkers. One of my go to um, King adaptations. Not adaptations, because it's an original story. It was but, an original screenplay by King. Yeah. But uh, it's such a, a wild and weird movie. Um, so basically, I'm sure some people haven't seen it. And if you have and don't like it, you're wrong. So stick with me here. Sleepwalkers <laughs> is essentially these like weird ancient cat beings that sort of live throughout history. And they basically live on the souls of virgins. And the movie takes place in the 90s. And it's these these two characters, a a mom and a son, kind of. I mean, they're mom and son in in, the world. They have a bit of an incestuous relationship. So the entire movie is about this mom and son that fuck, uh, but need to feed on the the souls of virgins. And they got to kind of like trap a virgin and convince a virgin to, to come over. I think it's virgin women, actually, because the son has to go and like charm these like pretty girls. Yeah. And then they basically turn to cat people and then suck their souls. It's it's so it's so weird, but I, I love it so much. In fact, just to make sure that we're on the same page, I own it on Blu-ray. So that's that's nice. me. Yes, that's, that's a me. Screen Factory edition, right? Yes. Yeah. Great. Great. It's Doesn't true. Get... Mick, Mick Garris directed that one as well. Actually. I've I've always liked Mick Garris. He gave me uh, probably one of my favorite movies ever, which is Critters Two. Um, Critters Two, Psycho Four. He did some Freddy's Nightmares, and... The Stand. I mean, that alone, you uh, got me. Quicksilver Highway. He did the Shining miniseries, which I'll fucking fight anybody. Fighting a bullet. No, yeah. yeah which with, um... I was really impressed by that one. Yeah, I, I was going to put it on my list today, but I figured. That's kind of a sad one. So I was going to stick to something funny. David Arquette. But Alice Krieg steals his entire movie. Essentially, she plays the mother. And again, it is a very incestuous kind of sensual movie. It's a, it's a sexual movie. Kind of plays it straight. Like, let's say like a fire The first two acts. It plays yes. It. And yes. then the last act goes bonkers. Yeah. It goes into an, it becomes aliens. It, it's, it's Alice Krieg becomes the Terminator. She's blown the cars with the gun. She's like thrown. Corn on the cob, remember? You know, there's a couple of kills I wrote down that are my favorite. Uh, Ron Perlman, he plays like the, he's a young, tough cop. He gets his fingers chewed off. And then, like you mentioned, the, one of the best parts in the movie is Alice Creek takes a corn on the cob and stabs one of the cops in the back. Yeah. And the third the third act goes bonkers. There's a scene, I don't know if you remember, it's one of my favorites, where shit's going wild. Cops invade the house and the cats are attacking Alice Creed. She's yeah, fighting for her life. Yeah. And the cop shoots her with a shotgun and it goes through her and it just blows the cat off. <laughs> 
This is the most cameoed uh, horror movie of all time. Oh, yeah, 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 Stephen yeah. King, Clive Barker, um, Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper. You yeah. have Joe Dante, uh, John Landis. Yeah. I mean, all in this movie. Made Chinamic, who of course is Shelley from Twin Peaks. Yeah. Which, real quick, let's let's just go into this. Not only is she amazing in Twin Peaks, but the, one of the best scenes in the entire entity of the series is in The Return, when Ed and Norma get together finally, and it plays Otis right in the background, and it cuts to Shelley, and she's just holding the coffee, and she's breaking down. No, babe, I'm down on my knees. Masterpiece of a scene. But she's just such a, a beautiful girl in this, and she's like so innocent, and she plays it so well, and she becomes the heroine. She becomes like a, a tough badass. And yeah. it's a schlocky, dumb movie, but Mick Garris plays it straight, and then he plays it action-y. Nobody seems to like it, because the score is pretty low on Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb, <clears throat> but you know what? Um, people are wrong. Have some fun. Simple as that. I, I, I enjoy Sleepwalkers. I always remember the opening with the Enya song. But yes, that was an Enya song in the opening. Yeah, the score, it has an Enya score that keeps coming back mm -hmm. in. It's that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my problem with Sleepwalkers, the first two acts, you know, the setup and the beings and everything, as you said before, was tackled fairly seriously. Brian Krause, you know, like luring the girl, you know, and and it had me about the balls. And then the last act, it's either you're going to go with it or you, you won't. It goes completely batshit fucking crazy. It's almost, what's with the faces, man? Good. It Get should. It should. <laughs> It, 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 it plays I'll beat the shit out of you, my it goes all fucking crazy. Don't watch Shocker, motherfucker. Well, um, Shocker doesn't Shocker crazy the end too. Shocker, is, uh, Shocker actually has the same problem. It starts off straight, and by the time uh, Oris Pinker dies and comes back, then it's Nightmare on Street 4. I like and, a crazy third act. I think it's always a, a fun little anyways, switch. Adam, Look, I enjoyed the film. I appreciate the film. I thought Mick Garris did a fantastic job directing it. Great acting. Most of it is set in daylight, which is always ballsy yes. for a film. Very so good, Brett. Yeah. That. Uh, the actors are great, but the last act, I always had trouble digesting it because it was going one way and then it just fucking took a quick right and went the other way, totally batshit crazy. And it, it was always harder for me to digest that. But overall, I'll take Sleepwalkers over half the shit that's coming out today. So, yeah. so you know what? No, I do recommend it. It's at least it, it has balls. It goes into directions that most movies today would not. Like even the incestuous uh, relationship between. The, I know. Yeah, it gets real um, weird. Yeah, real cat weird. mother and the cat son. It's pretty out there, man. So nah, good, good, good pick, bro. One more thing before I forget. I always thought that the cat people were super cheesy, like more cheesy than they should have. And then I was listening to the um, the commentary track, or maybe it was actually maybe I read an article. I can't forget which. I did both. But they're saying that essentially the effects artist who did the cat people suit when they become the cat beings yeah. had to rush it. And that essentially he finished it and then it became the look for what the aliens looked like in uh, the Tommy Knockers. The Tommy oh, Knockers are what- Actually, you know what? I could see that, yeah. Yeah, are kind of like the upgraded version with the kiss cat people. It looks like a weird suit, you know? It's, it's stupid, but I mean- I actually kind of like the, 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 the design and the effects. I know I did, I like the- <laughs> Your design and the effects. Fair enough. Happy. I'd take it over CGI because at least I could see yeah. it. It reflects the light and it has a presence. But yeah, man, uh, weird cat people sucking virgin souls and a mother and son having sex. Can't go wrong. Hey, it, it ain't boring. boring. It ain't boring. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's not. Pet Cemetery. OG, Mary Lambert. Yes, I've heard of it. Which is probably one of my... Um, Favorite King adaptation. I, I see. I know you hate the fucking thing. It's one probably one of my favorite King adaptations. Uh, Pet Cemetery for a very long time. George Romero was actually attached for a long time to direct it. Was considered uh, an unfilmable adaptation due to the content. Uh, I read the book. Wow, just ripped me apart, man. Such a tough book. Just emotionally stirring and, and heartbreaking and macabre and out of line, you know, especially when you start, you know, involving children, you know, in murder and stuff like that. Romero, it didn't happen. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think he had disagreement with the producers. And then finally, Mary Lambert, who was a music video director, she did Like a Prayer by uh, Madonna. She got on board, King wrote the script. It pretty much hit broad strokes, pretty much every plot thread that the book had, you know, from Zelda, you know, the sister, the flashbacks and stuff like that. The film itself for me, it addresses uh, themes that are universal. So, you know, love, family, 
and more importantly, uh, grief and what we're all going to meet someday, death. The grief part, not being able to cope with it and being given this opportunity to not have to cope with it and bring back your loved ones. Because in case you guys don't know, it's about family moves to uh, you know house in Maine and uh, there's a pet cemetery nearby. And if you bury something that dies within it, if you don't, you guys don't know this, shame on you. Uh, it comes back to life, but not normal. And it comes back to life possessed or warped or twisted or my ex-girlfriend, wh whichever you want to fucking call it. Actually, one scene that for, for me kind of like influenced me in my own creative endeavors is the scene where Gage, if you haven't seen the movie, spoiler, so, you know, mute it. Gage, the little boy, gets run over by the Mack truck. Bang! Then the cut to little shoot. Then cut to Del Midkiff, who plays the dad. No! Then cut to, this is a fucking genius of that fucking scene. Cut to, psh, flash. It just flashes pictures of that kid and then cuts back to that little fucking shoe. I thought editing wise, using visuals to evoke emotion, pure freaking genius. It was genius. I actually rewatched the scene, just that scene alone uh, yesterday. I was like, man, that's how you do it. The movie's creepy, has a great score, uh, moves at a good pace has some really um, off-putting violence, you know, a little scalpel, the ankle, I'll just leave it at that. Great performance by Fred Gwynn. Uh, my only complaint, I'm not sure if it's the dialogue or the acting, so the written page or the acting or both, but randomly, it's a little off, especially when it comes to uh, the, the mom and the dad. The kids are great. Actually, the, the young girl, her name is, I wrote it down here, Ellie. Ellie, Ellie Creed, yeah. Yeah, um, Ellie Creed, you know, who's played by two twin uh, actresses. And she's whining a lot, the, the character whines a lot, but it's realistic, I buy her. You know, uh, Gage, I buy him. Fred Gwynn, I buy him. But Del Midkiff and the wife, whom I forgot the name of the actress, she was on Star Trek at some point. I don't know, sometimes I didn't buy it. But other than that, I think it's a really strong film and it always uh, hits me right here. Now tell me why you hate it, Lance. Mr. I did not see Shocker yet. Oh shit, dude, go ahead, Grandpa. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna extend an olive branch here. And what I'm about to say is unpopular, and I understand that. I don't claim to be a king expert. I'm an expert in nothing except sleep. I read the book too. I read it in high school, and I, I read it uh, in the pandemic. It's it's an amazing book. Very slow burn. Though. I th I sometimes think King is best in miniseries form, especially if we kind of adapt him today because the 90s miniseries as great as they were they were limited by people not believing the material and of course the mpaa or whatever the version that the um on tv that is i realized that this book takes forever it's a great book but it's not a book with a lot of action it literally is like a chunk that's just the father and the, and the daughter and the mother and it's just the relationship it's just building this family and so I do appreciate a few things that Mary Lambert did. Uh, Fred Gwen um, as Judd Crandall is amazing. Of course, mm -hmm. her monster, um, I always kind of oh, think yeah. of him uh, as the, the judge from Mycos and Benny. Accord at least according to the page in the book, I feel like the most authentic version. That's kind of what we got out here. That sort of like hard main accent. There's all the time crossing back and forth on that route. Is luck or on out? Guess I'll never be lucky. Hell, I ain't married anyone. He's iconic. South Park uses him. And so here's what I'm going to say. I get why people love this movie. I, I'm not stupid. I, I get it. And, and I would never discount people's love for it because I, I feel that I understand why it connects to people. That being said, I think it's so fucking boring. It bothers me. I think, no offense, Dale Midkiff is on Xanax or Ambien or whatever he's on. God bless him. Give me some. Honey, church will be fine. You know, I can take a look at that for you. I thought you might have. I know you don't approve of the subject. John, I buried my son today. If something good doesn't come from Gage's death, I think. Why I hate is why people love it. It's because they connected. I was like, I fucking hate everybody here. I'm so goddamn bored. Except for Judd. I was all and about Gage. Judd. You gotta love Gage, you know? Nah, no, fair. no, 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 no. Love Gage. No, I, 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 have no, I have no parental uh, love. I like, I have four shirt letters and I love small dogs. I couldn't give a shit about that kid. I would, I would have like, stuffed him myself. You know what he like? He like gives him a shot, he cries. I'm like, nah, I shoot him twice. I would give him two shots. I just think this is a good example of, of the material being very dramatic and it not translating well to screen. I think it was just the wrong time and the wrong actors. It was a little too oh, yeah, And literal. the remake was the right time and the right actors? I, the remake had a lot of flaws, but I, I do believe the remake hit the tone better. 
I, I really, really actually do. I do. Yeah. I don't know. The remake has a lot of flaws. The fact that Ellie is is clean after her accident it annoys me. I don't like that they changed. The fact Ellie. they gender swap. Well, I, I think they did that because it's easier to kill a, a like a twelve year old than a little child, and I, I think that's a really weak move. Um, I agree. Yeah. But the very end of that movie is them killing the fucking kid. Um, and again, my my big thing is I think uh, Dale Medkiff and Denise Crosby are miscast. Simple as that. Um, no, and, that, and I feel I feel you on that. I feel, like I said before, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm never sure when I watch it, and not the whole way. I ain't buying it as much as I should, and I'm not sure if it's the dialogue or the acting nah, of both it's from Del McKibben and Dennis Crosby. You exactly. think it's the acting, right? Well, I mean, I, I I always say this: unless it's truly bad dialogue, like truly bad. I mean, the actors usually can elevate it, and the the dialogue isn't bad. It, it's a little, you know, plain. But I I almost think the right actors maybe a, a little bit of uh, a cadence would do a little better. I just always thought this was such a boring. Uh, well, I didn't find it boring. No, I know. I don't. I, I, I am the only person, trust me, with the comments. I, this is before. So when I when we push this and it, yeah. it goes live, I'll be eating alive. Where the fuck you get off talking to people about me behind my back going over my head? What people? What people would you think I wasn't going to find out? That, that, that brings me to uh, what we've been talking about. I'm going to be that guy, John. In fact, again, the spectacles. I, I got a whole list. I got a whole list. <laughs> now, I know this isn't technically a Stephen King movie because it's it's more derivative of uh, his original. So, so Pet Cemetery 2, which is what I'm going to argue oh. right now. Stephen King's movie Pet Cemetery has a sequel, and this has all the themes and the ideas from the first, which he did write. So I think it is a, a, a valiant uh, argument here. Okay, so if, if people haven't seen it, it's basically about Edward Furlong and his dad from ER, uh, Anthony Edwards, moving to I'll Ludlow, Maine after their mom dies in a movie set accident and essentially gets kind of like uh, caught up in the, the myth and the lore of the town. And they, you know, they bury obviously the dead past the pet cemetery in the uh, Indian burial ground or Native American burial ground. And then they come back and then kind of shit gets wild. So there's a couple things I want to get out of the way uh, real quick. Clancy fucking Brown. I, <laughs> I love I Clancy it. Brown. He's I, the movie, dude. Uh, the, the Kurgan. He is Captain Hadley. I have something to say. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Beside Mert, this fucker's having himself an accident. He is essentially the antagonist. Gus is... Uh, Drew's like, stepdad, and he's abusive. Yeah. He's, he's like uh, this macho guy. And he ends up getting killed, and, and Drew freaks out because his, his mom obviously loves this guy, even though he's a piece of shit, and they bury him beyond the pet cemetery under the Indian burial ground. He comes back, and he's just weird. From that point, the movie becomes a little rock and roll. And I think, <laughs> you think? That's why like, I think Pet Cemetery does does better for me is because Mary Lambert is able to use her music video directing and she does a lot of stylistic things in this that I like. It has a 90s sort of, not only is it a 90s soundtrack, but a 90s uh, directing style. It's very uh, lucid. It has a lot of weird dream sequences. There's a part where Anthony yeah, Edwards- the, the, the dog, uh, dog, fan, head, the dog it, head and the rocking uh, I mean, chair with boobies. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. in a great tit shot. I mean, at least in terms of um, being in great shape, like let's just step back and, and for me being a guy, like great shape just uh, a healthy woman um you know but it's weird there's a lot <laughs> there's a you're lot being, of you're being so polite led by the fact that clancy brown has an 80s killer vibe he has a lot of one-liners a uh, witty dialogues there's a scene um where he laughs at the dinner table and yeah. he's and, and edward furlong's laughing and he's kind of being this everybody's awkward. laughing yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he stops <laughs> Yeah, he fucks with people. He fucks yeah. them. There's the 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 bully in this is the kid from uh, Big. I think to me is a great example of what this movie is in terms of tone. Where the kid is a big bully, is a big prick. He's trying to like kind of scare Edward Furlong into hurting his kitten because he likes kittens. And yeah. we've been over how I feel about cats because I'm allergic. But he he flips over his bicycle and he's talking to Edward Furlong and he's like, "I'm going to cut your nose off with the bicycle." And then Gus comes in and kicks them all out. And then he takes his motorbike yeah. and he's, he's, he's screwing with him. He's laughing and his uh, scarf gets caught and just crunches his entire face yeah. and blood splats against Gus. He goes, yeah, there's black humor, but it's mixed with, I think, a great amount of darkness. It's not 
the loss of a child, which I, I definitely understand why people would feel that way. Uh, but I like that this is almost uh, the reverse, where it's this guy missing his mom, but then there's this, this crazy murderer, almost like a, a, a late Freddy Krueger, murdering people, burying people, bringing them back. He's like cool, but he's kind of scary. And I think something that got me as a kid, Gus, and spoilers, murders his son, stepson, and his wife. And as a kid, I remember thinking like, oh, they're not safe. There's a part where um, the, the kid, Drew, has a gun. He's going to shoot uh, Gus. And he <laughs> drops the bullet. He goes, you forgot, you forgot something, Drew Boy. And it's his hammy uh, yeah. uh, New England main accents. So that is my argument. So boom, there we go. I said it. Well, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm sure you are. Yeah. But, but, but not in the way that you think. Number one, it's not a better sequel than the original. It's a different one. Tonally, it's completely different. The, the, the first one went for heavy, dramatic, played it straight. It's not about laughs. Mary Lambert, who comes from a music video background, held back, okay? So in, in, in just the shot compositions and, and everything. It's, it's, the first one is directed like a mature, serious film. The second one went complete polar opposite. The second one's batshit crazy. You said a little bit rock and roll, I disagree. Full on rock and roll. The yeah. second one, she's fully embraced her music video roots, and it literally is directed like a music video. She takes the situation, the, the, the rules, the structure, you know, if somebody dies and comes back to life from the first one, but now plays it fucking out there. Uh, you know, Clancy Brown, uh, I, I think everybody in that movie dies and comes back. You know, the bully comes back. Uh, every, the, uh, yeah, yeah. Everybody dies and comes back in that movie for, for the most part. It's a rock and roll, gory as fuck, it's super violent. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah. Compared yeah, yeah. to the first one, which was not that violent. Even the visuals, great, like, like that scene we talked about, the chick with the big tits and the dog head or whatever the fuck it was. It's so bizarre, yeah. And with, yeah. With, with the 90s slow motion, you know, while she's rocking in a chair, it looks like it's straight out of a music video. Black hole sun, won't you come? It took me a, a couple of viewings to get it, appreciate and fully embrace that no, this is not like the first one, this own animal. But once I have after like viewing number three or something, I really love this movie. I think it's so much fun. It's completely fucking bonkers and up there. It does what a sequel is supposed to do. It's like Alien and Aliens. Yes. Alien is, you know, suspense driven and slow build and Aliens an action film. Yeah, Terminator, Terminator 2. Yeah. Movie over and over again, yeah. And I, I think it's a great horror party movie. It's a great movie to watch with a bunch of friends, you know, get fucked up, whatever your poison is. I can't condone anything on camera. Uh, get fucked up and have a great time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. kudos, man, because I love that movie too. Uh, before we go into, uh, we, we close it off, I just want to say um, shame on us, Night Flyer. I'll leave it at that. <laughs>